Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones. Please thank our four Yudaki players led by Jalu Guruwiwi, uh, representing the four directions of this land for that wonderful welcome. Now we be... OK, yes, we can clap as well. We begin tonight's Q&A by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land. We're in Yolnu country in the remote northeast corner of Arnhem Land as guests of the Yachty Yindi Foundation and the Gama Festival and answering your questions tonight. The CEO of the Northern Land Council, Joe Morrison. Australia's most influential indigenous leader, Noel Pearson. Galpu clan elder and businesswoman, uh, Dungal Guruwiwi. The deputy chair of the Yotu Yindi Foundation, Jawa Yunupingu. Olympic gold medalist, Labor Senator for the Northern Territory, Nova Paris and the first Aboriginal elected to the House of Representatives, Liberal MP, Ken Wyatt. Please welcome our panel. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Q&A is simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio. You can join the Twitter conversation using the Quanda hashtag on your screen as usual. Now, this is a night of firsts, the first Q&A focused on Australia's first people and the first Q&A to include so many Indigenous people on the panel and in the audience. So let's get straight to our first question, which comes from Jasli uh, Gura, Gura Guruk. Thanks, Tony. Um, my question's for the whole panel. When the Constitution, I balanda o rom yan, bang on yulong o rom tong ora Constitution or nakulim loka mo ma treaty o. The Australian Constitution and the Australian state were founded on the myth of Terra Nullius, the assertion that Australia was uninhabited at the time of settlement. As an Indigenous person who has lost my language, my culture and identity under white colonialism, why should I assent to falsely established Australian law by asking to include my people within its founding document? A treaty is the only way to assert our original sovereignty and equality. So why are you, with respect, our Indigenous leaders, settling for a watered-down attempt at recognition in the Australian Constitution? Well, Ken White, we'll start with you because you are the chair of the Parliamentary Committee into the Constitutional Referendum on Recognition. So let's hear what you say to this idea. It should be a treaty. Let, let me... Tony, I think it's great that we have the questioning occurring because part of the process is for all of us to have the dialogue. But what we've got to remember is Australia was only known as Australia from 1788. Before that, it had several other names. But Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have had a continuity of existence with this land for that period of time. They were left out of the um, constitutional conventions. They were left out of the 1901. We live in this country and we deserve to be recognised within the constitution, but that doesn't negate aspirations for those who want treaty or sovereignty. When Australia is ready for that, that debate can occur in the future. So two things are possible. Two things are possible. Nova Paris. Um, for me, this, this whole discussion, um, you know, it's like what you're saying, you know, there's a lot of Aboriginal people that have lost their identity since um, colonisation. And the significance of being recognised in this, this document is to me and to other Aboriginal people, it's about the true history of this country, the entire genetic makeup of this country, what is now called Australia. <laughs> and you can't, um, it's, it'd be wrong to say that you would continue to lose more by having this important, um, I guess, conversation is what we're having now with the Australian public. And, you know, there's so many Australians, you know, through the terra nullius, through the land rights, through there's so many historical things that have, have occurred. But this is, is so important on an international level and also to Aboriginal people because we will be finally be seen as citizens that make up this country. Nova, do you worry that the broader Australian public hasn't yet focused on this, don't mm -hmm. really understand what it's all about? Well, that, that is true. And I think, you know, we need to acknowledge the, the recognised movement who have actually gotten out there and, and they've made a tremendous contribution to having that discussion amongst the, the wider community. Um, we see at the, the AFL, um, you know, there are a, a number of national sporting organisations that are on board this and we need to have the conversations. You know, we're, we're talking about human beings being inclusive in a country, 
you know, what we call Australia. And as we all know, we're the oldest collective race in the world. And, and I say this every time I have conversations, Australia doesn't lose 230 years. You, you gain 40,000 years of history. How do you answer directly the, the young woman's question? She's asking why a constitutional um, referendum for a constitution that doesn't mean anything to her, as, as she puts it, what's necessary in her mind is a treaty. I, I guess that, that's a conversation that a lot of indivi individuals would be thinking. You know, when you talk about treaties, when you talk about, um, you know, how far we've come now as, as, as Australians, um, there's, there's a debate to be had with regards to um, what could possibly go to the Australian public. And uh, we, we can't lose that momentum. You know, we've got to continue on because it's, as Aboriginal people, we are excluded. You know, for, a, for a such a long time, we were regarded as flora and fauna. You know, and it's, and it's about making a wrong right. Noel Pearson. Tony, I was 24 years old when I went to one of the most galvanising seminars where I heard Michael Mansell speak for the first time on the subject of a treaty between uh, the a Aboriginal sovereign nation and the Australian nation. I was just a law student at the time and uh, it was a real challenge that Mansell raised at the end of that seminar and his question at the end of it was, are we Australian Aborigines or Aboriginal Australians? And he challenged us that we need to make a choice one way or the other. And I suppose in all of my advocacy, I've, I'm making the case that we are Aboriginal Australians, that the nation of Australia can carve out a recognition and a space for our people as a distinct people and uh, with distinct traditions. I would say to the young lady that I don't accept that uh, she's lost her identity. I come across tens of thousands of Aboriginal people who live in a great variety of different circumstances, and I see their traditions, I see their heritage, and I see their entitlement for recognition. And of course, there's a big spectrum. I come here to Arnhem Land, really, to, to share a part of the classical culture, which used to exist all over the continent, on the four corners. And, uh, but that doesn't deny, in my view, the fact that if you're living in Sydney, if you're living in Melbourne, if you're living on the eastern seaboard, that you don't have an identity. And I think it's desperately important that we reach a settlement with the rest of Australia about protecting and for the first time recognising that identity. Noel, what do you think should be in um, the referendum question? Because we heard Bill Shorten uh, here yesterday say there needs to be written into the Constitution, <coughs> as the expert panel on this suggested, actually, a protection against discrimination? Well, it's discrimination that's kind of underwritten our parlous position in this country. It's been the source of the great miseries that we've endured. It was discrimination that left us out of the Constitution in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the question that, that we will go through as we discuss the expert panel's report and the report produced by the committee that Nova and Ken were members of is the question of whether some kind of guarantee against discrimination is part of the provisions that are taken forward or whether Aboriginal people need to have a say over their own affairs so that, you know, we decide that we, what, what applies to our people and and, and the protections and recognition that we deserve. And I think this is a big question. It'll play out over the next two years, probably. And um, I, I look forward to the, a good debate about this. Uh, Jawa, the great Yachty Indy song everyone remembers, I'm sure, is Treaty. And the chorus went Treaty Now. Um, what do you think? Do you think it's time for a treaty or constitutional referendum? Or can you have both? Uh, when my brother wrote the song about treaty, it was only a song. 
song was written because of the former prime minister when he said, there shall be a treaty. And that was back in 1998, right? Mm -hmm. Long time ago. Now it's 2014. That's six years. Oh, not, not six years, but 16? Mm -hmm. Long time. Long time. You think it'll ever happen? If we don't lose our hopes, I agree to the young lady there. Please do not give hope, give up hope. Mm. Because at a state, one of my statements last year at Karma, I said, I simply said this. We, the Yolngu people of this country, this, from Arnhem Land, do not stand apart from you. We stand with you. And young lady, please do not give, give up hope. There shall be a treaty. I can ask you uh, what you think. The young lady was saying we shouldn't bother with the referendum, but I think a lot of people will be bothering and there'll be a huge debate. What do you think? I agree with, with what Jawa said and I stand in with this young lady as well. Yeah. Yep. But you, th you would encourage people to go out and vote in the referendum and be <laughs> part of the big debate about the referendum as well when it happens? I would. <laughs> Joe Morrison. I think the, uh, the question about constitutional recognition represents an enormous step forward in the maturing of the country. And we've seen for a long time many important events that have galvanised Aboriginal people. Um, you know, the pastoral awards, strike in the Pilbara, land rights, Mabo, uh, things here in the Northern Territory like the Branga Statement have been profoundly important events that have galvanised people. And I think the question of the constitutional recognition shouldn't be seen as being exclusive to all other attempts to bring the country into a, a high level of maturity. And I think that's in the context that it should be taken that this is a profoundly important step for the nation to make. It's a profoundly important step for Aboriginal people to embrace the country and for the rest of the country to embrace the uniqueness that Aboriginal people bring. So I think it is something that is worthwhile pursuing. Uh, it's worthwhile pursuing for my own kids as well as their kids to be able to enjoy the fruits of the country in all that it brings. And uh, I would wholeheartedly uh, recommend that we pursue it but not take our eye off other opportunities in the future. Okay, let's move on. Just yes, on go on, Ken. Yes, go ahead. Can I say that to the young lady, the 1967 referendum changed the mindset of Australians towards our people. The speech by Paul Keating at Redfern mm. was a landmark speech of recognition of the challenges of the past and the disposition, the dispossession that occurred. And then the apology healed so many of us, including my mother, who was from the stolen generation. And the next step was then to move to the completion of the Constitution. And from that, we will build to the stages that will complete the social fabric of this nation to make it a nation in which we are all equals. Ken, just very briefly, and we've got lots of other questions to go to, but do you think you could potentially see a treaty in your lifetime? Probably not in my lifetime. Uh, I'm much older now than what I used to be if in the period that Noel was talking about. But I think Australia, in its growth and maturation, will reach a point where there will be arrangements that go into place. And treaty is a word that certainly a Prime Minister committed to, but never followed up with. OK, let's move on. We do have a lot of uh, questions. We've got one from Pierre Prentice. The recommendations contained in the recent review by Andrew Forrest were really a breath of fresh air. They seemed like a cohesive, 
and very common sense blueprint for dealing with problems that our multi-layered bureaucracy seems to have struggled with and failed to get on top of after decades and billions of dollars. My question for the panel is simply this. Why shouldn't those recommendations be adopted and implemented? Noel Pearson. Well, I've got no problems with Andrew Forrest's report. In fact, I support the recommendations of his report. It's been the subject of a comprehensive process of discussion around the countryside. I think there's a great deal of consensus around the recommendations dealing with employment and training and early childhood and primary school education and so on. But of course the, the hot button issue is the measure of a healthy welfare card. I am personally in favour of that. Tell us why. Because I'm concerned about vulnerable people in my own community and that I see in communities throughout Australia. Um, I want every child to grow up in a household that has food in the fridge, that has a blanket on the bed and that has the basic needs met. And uh, I believe that, that supporting particularly vulnerable families to have their domestic lives in some kind of order so that children can grow up and, uh, and have everything that other Australian children have. Um, I just know that with the problems afflicting our communities, um, that, that you know, the management of the income that's coming into a family is like the crucial first step. In Cape York, we say a better life begins with a budget. You, you can't have food if you don't budget. You don't have a blanket if you don't budget. You don't have tuck shop money if you don't budget. And I just think, you know, a lot of people might, people who live in advantage often forget that some basic things need to come together in a family in order for a child to prosper in life. And so I know this is going to be a, a, a hot button issue, the matter of the healthy welfare card, but I think that properly targeted and with a measure of opt-in, I think, you know, the, the, there ought to be a mechanism for communities and individuals to opt into um, those arrangements. I think a, a mixture of opt-in arrangements and, in, in the case of vulnerable people, supporting them in relation to the manage of mo management of money, I, th I think this will effect a, a real revolutionary lift in the prospects of the most disadvantaged people. Joe Morrison, what do you think? I mean, we're talking here about income management. It's applied already uh, to communities in the Northern Territory. Um, and Twiggy Forrest wants it to be national. Well, I mean, I think uh, experience here in the Northern Territory uh, tells us, and, but firstly, I should say that uh, uh, absolutely, we should be uh, doing what we can as a society to uh, look after the most vulnerable people. But if we look at the history here in the Northern Territory with the intervention um, and the way that that was uh, put into place, I think it's fair to say that uh, a lot of people were uh, pretty hurt in the way that they were treated. Absolutely hurt. And uh, there is still a lot of suffering uh, from people. Um, is one thing, and, but I would also suggest that the tide that came with it in terms of the amount of uh, public servants and the overlays with respect to the bureaucracy, uh, which was never part of the uh, early discussions, uh, left what I believe is a pretty amazing and difficult situation for people to grapple with. Uh, people had no control and no say over the futures of, of, of their families, and particularly where people were doing tremendously important and good work in some of our communities. Uh, some of those uh, enterprises and those abilities to take control of their affairs were removed from them. Uh, so we, I think when we talk about 
uh, dealing with welfare, it is uh, firstly important to understand the entirely complex nature of it, that we're dealing with people who are vulnerable, and we need to do it in partnership and absolutely with their informed consent so we can uh, work together uh, in partnership with them. Heather Ferris. Um, I've actually heard you speak very passionately about income management just the other day. Yeah, I... Going back to what Joe was talking about with the intervention, um, Aboriginal people were painted with one brush stroke and Aboriginal men were demonised and we, that, was, that was another, I guess, systemic policy of this country that con continued and still continues to this day and I think there are elements of that report that I've, I've read, I haven't read all of it, that um, suggest we're going down the same path again. When you look at the, um, I guess, the income management, there were 22,000 Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory on it. When you look at the fact that it costs between five to eight thousand dollars per person for administrative costs, the discrimination that it inflicted upon Aboriginal people was horrific. And like what Joe said, we're still scarred from that. Um, you actually gave, I heard you speak the other day about mm, this and gave the case of a supermarket. A supermarket, exactly, in, in Alice Springs, where I walked in. Um, um, in 2007 and there was a queue there and the queue had a sign basic card and you looked up and it was just all Aboriginal people. The other queues people happily went through and used their ATM cards to purchase whatever they wanted. So when you're talking about empowering Aboriginal people, you know, the language, the colourful language, it's like what um, Joe was saying today, you know, like Dr Unipingu in his songs that he wrote were just talking over and over and over and over again and um, we still haven't got it right. You know, when you think of the fact we are the oldest collective race in the people in the world with yet the fastest dying race of people and the fact that we've got Twiggy's report and he's wanting to roll this out, it's going to be his job to actually talk to the two and a half million Australians that are going to be subjected to discrimination to say that you can't control your lives, we're going to control, and Aboriginal people have suffered that, you know, intergenerational, um, I guess, discrimination since 1788, and let's we continue to have it. Let's hear from uh, Ken White on this, because uh, the, the Forest Report is, is not just about this one issue, is it? It goes a lot broader than that. Now, look, I've read the report fully now, and I agree with all of it. But I would never have called it a welfare card because there are some families who are vulnerable. And he makes the point that there are families who are vulnerable that need support and interventions. And government agencies in both state and Commonwealth do it all the time. But the notion of a welfare card, and I, had, I disagreed with the basics card, I would have rather have seen a debit card being given to those families that made it look as though it was any other financial transaction. But the report covers all of the things that have been said in the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody and the various reports that have been tabled uh, within parliaments across this nation. The issue for me is when do we draw a line in the sand and say enough is enough? We have communities that there is poverty, there, is le there are levels of illness that is not acceptable, there are gaps in education. And yet, when you look at budget figures over the progressive governments, both coalition and Labor, the amount that has been put into Aboriginal affairs is substantial. So why aren't we seeing the return for investment with that? So I think that the Andrews report provides a platform or a framework for reform, but I would want it done through a process where the community are equal partners in the engagement, that the solutions are part of what's negotiated, not the previous practice. Because you can never bring about change unless you are a player within that change and you determine. And certainly here at Gama, I've heard that message loud and clear from everybody. This is about working together to find solutions that have both dignity, compassion, but have outcomes that make a difference in the lives of Aboriginal children and families. Yeah, no, they wouldn't yeah, get it. I, I could talk with 
there are elements of the report where Twiggy and I heard him speak um, here at Gama, where he talked about early childhood education, about zero to 40 year olds, they're the most imperative years of children. And totally agree with that. And if you look at what, what's happening now is, is this government, um, when you're talking, there's a lot of budget cuts to education, to early childhood education. So you've got a man who's going out trying to um, talk about this is the solution, but he's going to have to go back to Tony Abbott to talk about there are a significant amount of budget cuts to the area that he wants to say that we should be investing in, and that's at early childhood education. Um, we, what Ken was saying with regards to um, how the in intervention happened, Aboriginal people, and I've spoken to so many people, people came into their communities. They didn't ask to come in, they imposed themselves on Aboriginal people. They said, you need this, you need that. And I've seen communities where they went and built houses on sacred sites. Those, the houses in, in Western Australia and in parts of the Northern Territory, they remain vacant. It's like, because you are black in this country, you can't be good enough to participate. And it's like so long, so many times now, Aboriginal people are just being told and dictated how they will run and how they're going to run their lives. And, and we see it far too often. And you can't have a, um, a relationship if you're not going to have everyone Walk, working and walking together. I just, want, I just want to hear, yeah, I know you want to respond to that, so go ahead. There's another kind of queue I've seen. It's the queue in front of the ATM machine, in front of the bowls club, where the poker machines are. What do we do about that queue? And the question about intervention, what, what do we do when the kids aren't getting a feed, they're being neglected. Should we intervene and support that family to make sure there's food in the fridge and the, they're able to um, tackle their addictions by making sure the rent is paid and the food is in the fridge? Or do we stand back and say, no, we won't intervene and we'll let the child protection authorities intervene later and take the kids away? Which one do we want? To support the family so that the child can stay with mum and dad or stand back and let the child be taken away by the child protection authorities? In Cairns, you drive around the streets, the buses have got advertisements asking for more foster parents asking people from the public to volunteer as foster parents to take Aboriginal children in. So, you know, it's easy to say we shouldn't intervene and so on, but by us not intervening, that's why our, our children are 3% of the population, but 60% of the kids in child protection, not living with their mothers and fathers. No, I, we're going to move on, Noel, but just very briefly. <laughs> the fundamental difference appears to be that in your community, in Cape York, and in the experiment you've put together, it is the community itself which makes the decision who goes on income management, not the bureaucrats. Absolutely. And we, you know, the, the whole business of advocating for the intervention in those vulnerable households came from us. We wanted it. And we wanted our elders to decide where intervention was appropriate and where it was not. And we want to encourage people to take responsibility. And if they do, they should be left alone. But where they don't, you know, we can wipe our hands clean of it, but the end destination for that kid is that they're the ones going off to Brisbane and Cairns living with strangers. Let's move on, because we've got a lot of questions. Many of them are on education. This one's from Yalme Unipingu. I'm a, my husband was a late Dr. Yunipingo, the lead singer of Yossi Indi and the founder of Garma Festival. I'm a mother and a grandmother. 
My children were educated at Yakala School, and they are bilingual, bicultural, and literate in both Yolngomata and English. The United Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, Article 14, states, Indigenous people have the rights to establish and control their education system and institutions, providing education in their own languages in a manner appropriate to their culture methods of teaching and learning. My question to my question is to Nova. If the ALP win the next federal election, will your party commit <coughs> to resourcing and supporting bilingual programs? Nova, well, we'll start with you. We'd like to hear from uh, everyone else on the panel. Um, thank you, Yao Mei, for your question. And um, as you know, I have a great deal of respect um, for the late Dr. Yuno Pingu and, and your family. I think in your question, um, you already gave the answer with regards to you're a product of bilingual education. Your late husband was a product of bilingual education. Your children have been. I've travelled to 50 countries around the world and I um, have seen many, many, many schools around this country that um, have bilingual education. Why don't we have it here in the Northern Territory? And if I know that I, and I've spoken um, many times before as I have, there is no reason and why we shouldn't have bilingual education. It's almost like we accept everything else, but we, we don't have a problem with who we are. We don't have a problem with our language. It's almost like everyone else has a problem and we are denied the most basic fundamental human rights of being who we are as Aboriginal people and with regards to how we teach our children and maintaining that cultural connection. And that is something that I would certainly, without a doubt, hand on heart, take back to the Labor Party. Oh. Ken, we'll have to hear from you briefly because we need to hear wh whether that same commitment might come from the uh, coalition. Let me say, look, as a teacher, I used to value children who had two languages, who were bilingual, because they were bicultural and they had a richness. And when you have your own mother tongue, you learn to be proficient in speaking, talking and reading in your own mother tongue. And then you learn to code switch. And the code switch enables you then to move between both. And certainly, I have always been a supporter of bilingual education, but it's something that I would certainly expect us to look at in the future. Because if we want educational outcomes to change from where they are in this country, then we're going to have to recognise that some of our Aboriginal communities have three or four languages that are spoken by children. And we've got to work from the known to the unknown, and that is to transition them from their language into English so they can walk both lives but have the opportunity of being successful in broader Australian society. Can we just go back to Yal? I'd like to just to ask you, um, are you happy with what you're hearing from the politicians? Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, the reason I ask this question is because um, my mother, one of my mother who passed away um, on the 14th of January this year, she was the last she was the last um, um, Waramri clan. She's a honey, honey um, <coughs> people. That's her totem. And um, there was two people left. And she was the last one who lived longer and only passed on the 13th of January. Um, her language is no longer be spoken. Is that, is that what, are you, are you worried that will happen to the other languages here? Yes. Let's hear from Joe on that. Just, just on that, Tony, yeah. I think it's important that we perpetuate language because language is the tool that enables us to take our culture 
And all of those nuances with our culture in the way that we do intonation of voice, song, dance, has to be perpetuated because that's the essence of any society or community. And it's important that language is preserved and not lost. In Noongar country, down in the southwestern area of Western Australia, there is a revival of language and it's made an incredible difference in schools where it's being taught because both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal kids are learning the Noongar language. And it's building a sense of pride. Joa, can I ask you what you think about this? Because governments uh, mm -hmm. seem to be moving in the opposite direction. They want uh, kids to learn English first and English predominantly. Good thing you asked me that question. Because um, I, um, I studied to be a linguist myself. And I see no reason why two languages can be taught in schools. Dunga, what do you think? You're a teacher as well. I am a teacher, and as Yelmay said, uh, children are bicultural, because they went through bilingual school. As for myself, I went to school, I, English was my first language, but I came back and I sort of do linguistic work as well. And I even teach non-Aboriginals the language, either through Skype or I just teach him. I love, the, that, I love the idea of you teaching him through Skype. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even know you had wireless. <laughs> and there are people from, some from far as last week I talked to a person from Cambodia on Skype here at the library at Vulkula. I was sitting outside talking to one. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. bilinguals, even it. though we'd, if government would take it away, we'd still be doing it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> now, what do you think? Do you have a, do you have a different opinion on this? No, I don't. I mean, when I first started thinking about the school's challenge. Many years ago, I went to schools in Cape York and I saw communities and families that were desperate about their languages and culture being taught in the school. And of course, the schools were trying to teach the children English and Western education and so on. And it seemed to be a, a, a fight for space fight for time, fight for teaching resources and so on. And the way in which we've approached it with our academy in Cape York is, is an idea I, I took from charter schools in the United States, which had an extended school day. So our academy day starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and it finishes at 4.30 in the afternoon. We've got a big agenda. We want to teach two cultures two languages, and, uh, and in order to do that, and so that we're not kind of having one fighting against the other, we have to open up the time, we have to double the number of teachers, we're going to involve Aboriginal teachers in the delivery of our programs, open up the space. It means you've got to have more resources, because we actually run our teachers in a shift. The guys who start at 8 o'clock finish at 2 o'clock, and the guys who start at 10 o'clock go out to 4 o'clock. Now, to resource this on a scale requires us to think about how we might re-engineer after-school programs to, to accommodate an extended school day. But in order to be fully bicultural in English and in the language of my community, Gugu Yimidir, in order to be, have facility in both, one of the things that I've, I, I'm a great believer in is that the, the need to extend the school day and for more resources to be put in to employ teachers um, to enable that bicultural thing to happen. OK, we've got to, we're going to move on because we've got quite a few questions to go to and we are running out of time, as inevitably happens. We've got another question. It's from Ben Long. Hey, Ben. Just get a... Yep, we've got a microphone there. Go ahead. I'm 16 years old and left um, for boarding school in Melbourne at the start of this year. I left Darwin because my mum and dad 
wanted me to have a good future and with access to opportunity. Why do I have to go all the way to Melbourne, away from my family, to get a good education and to, and to fulfil what I want to do when I'm older? Joe, can I start with you then? Um, if, I could, if I could start with a bit of my own experience. I mean, I, I grew up in a town called Catherine and uh, one of the things I lament in the discussion we just had is the, the fact that we weren't able to uh, have bilingual education. In fact, I probably did and gained my experience in school and started really learning after I, I left school, in fact. Uh, but the fact is, in the Northern Territory, uh, in, even in places like Darwin, as the capital city of the Northern Territory, we still are striving to get the levels and the standards of education required uh, for the entire population. Uh, that's, uh, I think, given and uh, it's unfortunate um, and I think it comes with the development of the country um, and in places, remote places, the gap is even bigger and people unfortunately have got to grapple with this question of do I remain in the public system uh, or the system that is available in these remote places or do I have to go somewhere else? Um, I just think in terms of the discussion about uh, Aboriginal affairs around the country, uh, about the enormous disparity between Aboriginal people and the rest of the country that we need to be uh, bold and ambitious. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and we can't take our eye off it. Uh, and as I said before, I think we need to uh, certainly embed Aboriginal people in that process. So people like Ben, when you go away, you learn that system, but you also learn it when you come home and you embrace those things uh, so you can grow and you can foster as a young man and, and uh, fulfil your uh, real potential. Uh, that's a challenge that the nation faces and it's particularly a challenge that Aboriginal people face. And I take my hat off to you to go away because I know how difficult it is for young kids to go away from their families. And uh, I just uh, take my hat off to you and, and uh, hope that you get the most that you can out of life. Uncle, you're, I think you've got grandchildren who are at boarding school, is that right? Why did you take that decision yourself? Well, the same as what you said, getting something for yourself. And I'm talking to my two grandchildren. You, I know you're watching me now. <laughs> <laughs> they both had, we now in a girls' school in Sydney. I want you to get the best, what this young boy here, that, that question that you've been asking me all the time, why are we, what are we doing here? It is for your own good that in the future, you will be able to thank me for what I've done to you. <laughs> <laughs> now, Noel, uh, you, have, you have strong feelings about this because you were sent off to boarding school and uh, I think you generally support this idea, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. There's been a tremendous growth in the numbers of remote kids particularly going to the best schools in the country. The Australian Indigenous Education Foundation has got a fantastic continental-wide program getting our kids into these best schools. I think the difference between the old residential schools was, you know, there was no choice involved. Whereas today, parents and grandparents are sending these kids off for a, for a better education. I mean, it'd be great if the local school was delivering a quality secondary education. Unfortunately, in, in the remote parts of the country, these, these local schools are not up to scratch. Um, it'd be much better if, if our regional and, and other high schools in the, in the remote areas were delivering a better education. But um, it's just a great thing. I think it's important to... It's an important part of the mix, but we've also got to fix up the high schools in the north. OK, you're watching Q&A. It's live from the Gama Festival under the night sky at Gulkala in northeast Arnhem Land, the most remote Q&A ever. Our next question comes from Joseph Lufat. Um, I'm a high school student and I often encounter situations that involve racism, either towards myself or others. Um, 
how can we change the mindsets of these racist thinkers? Ken Michael, I'll start with you. You've spoken very passionately about this. I've heard you already. Yeah, racism hurts. The comments that people make about you and your Aboriginality or any ethnicity leaves a mark. And I've had it several times throughout my life. And I shared in the forum uh, two days ago that as a child, racism was much more overt. The names we were called um, were the type of words we never hear, or we only hear them occasionally. But racism doesn't go away, because even in my current role, I still get barbs from people. I get the trolls on social uh, Facebook or through social media. I ignore them because I feel sorry for them. Because it means they haven't had the opportunity of sitting down with me or giving me the opportunity of having a conversation. Because I see myself no different to any other person. Because we have the capability, we have the skills, and we've shown that. It's about developing resilience. And resilience is being prepared to let it go over your head. My wife read a letter that I received and she got really upset. And she said to me, why aren't you reacting? And I said, because the moment I give attention to that person, they have won. By ignoring them and moving on, knowing that they've made that comment, it's like water sliding off a duck's back now. I've got used to that, but I will always champion and fight for people who are vulnerable to racism, and I will never reconcile from that. Nova, we, we heard from... Uh, thank you. We from the Australian of the Year, uh, Adam Goods, um, that what was said to him in the playground still mm. lives with him now. Mm. He can't forget it. He doesn't want to forget it. Yeah. And it still hurts. It, it does, and um, like Ken, like myself, like, you know... Hundreds and, you know, pretty much or probably 90% of Aboriginal people have all suffered um, racism. And it hurts to the bone. And we are human beings. And we should not be judged upon the colour of our skin, you know, or our beliefs. And I have children. I have a grandson. And as a mother, um, like what Ken was saying, I teach my children to rise above it. And it is very difficult. And there's a, the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will ever hurt me. And, but it doesn't take away that, that pain and that, that suffering that you're endured just for being who you are. And, you know, you've got these sporting codes, like, like with Adam Gould's, um, the AFL, they've done an enormous amount of work for um, stamping out racism. But I will use this opportunity um, as a politician, we've seen how um, which, you know, this government is wanting to repeal the Racial Discrimination Act, which has served this country well and its citizens who are vilified through racial discrimination for almost two decades. And when you have political figures, leaders, who are coming out and saying it's OK to be a bigot, it is not OK to be a bigot. It, racism is no okay, not OK. We, Can I, do you mind if I just bring yeah. Ken in here? Because I, uh, that came from your side of politics, and mm. I know you reacted pretty strongly uh, to it at the time. I mean, do you think that change will ever happen to the Racial Discrimination Act? Look, I, I think what's happening now is 5,000 submissions, or approximately around that number, have come forward to the mm. Attorney-General. I know that he's gone through them. And I know, and I can say categorically, when that comes back into the party room and we debate it, if it hasn't, got the mechanisms for protection, then certainly I will be challenging that lack of uh, commitment. Still prepared to cross the floor on this? Look, on the principle, yes, I am. It's, I'm, I'm, on this, I want to transcend <laughs> above the politics. It's more about a principle of protecting vulnerable people. I know our mob get it all the time, but I know other cultural groups experience the same barbs and pain. And I don't want to see that happen. I made a comment to a group of people, in fact, I'll be open, I made the comment in the party room, I said, a lot of you in here will never experience racial vilification. It is only a handful of us in this party room that will feel that. And let me tell you that the pain of that stays with people, it scars them. And you've got to be strong to transcend that. So my position won't change, and I certainly hope that when the Attorney-General brings it back, it has the protective measures in it and is not diminished. 
Joe, can I bring you back to the, the question that was asked from this young man who's experienced uh, racism in the playground. Is your community more sheltered from racism or do you still feel it here? We still feel racism in our communities. But, you know, as an elder or a man with families myself, I simply tell people, you know, just take my advice and ignore all of that. Just be proud of who you are, really. Proud of yourself and, you know, just simply walk away. We're going to move on because we do have quite a lot of other questions, as I've said. This one's from Jens Steer Meiser. This question is to Joe Morrison. On the front page of the Weekend Australian two days ago, the ex-chairman of the Northern Land Council, Galaroy Yunupinga, who is from this area, called for northeast La La Arnhem land, Aboriginal land rights to, be, to come home. If that were to happen, would the Northern Land Council become irrelevant? Joe. Uh, no, my view is that it wouldn't. Um, I think um, what we hear a lot, and uh, in my uh, small seven months uh, as a CEO of the Land Council, I understand the Northern Land Council, as is land rights generally across the country, has been and remains a polarising uh, matter that uh, Aboriginal people take seriously. And when you have significant leaders uh, like Mr Yunupingu calling for that to occur, I mean, obviously, uh, you can't ignore it as one thing, but secondly, understanding the actual details of it. And uh, I'm glad to say that we've had, uh, in the last uh, 24 hours, very productive conversations uh, with the family, with Jawa, um, and with other members about uh, rekindling a relationship between uh, the Northern Land Council and some of these leaders and understanding that the Northern Land Council operates across a population of at least 36,000 Aboriginal people. It's a profoundly important piece of legislation. It provides uh, communal property rights for people, uh, real recognition in the Australian Parliament about the uniqueness of Aboriginal culture. And that's a serious debate uh, that should only, in my mind, occur between Aboriginal people. Uh, and that's uh, at least my commitment, is that we are giving to uh, all Aboriginal people in the, in the Northern Land Council region uh, an ability for us to have a conversation about it. Um, I can certainly understand the need for uh, local autonomy, uh, but I do think we can achieve that uh, under our existing arrangements. But Joe, we are just very having briefly, a dialogue. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just very briefly, are you saying you're actually allowed to, uh, you're actually prepared to allow much more autonomy for communities like Jawas to actually make decisions on development um, outside of the Land Council? The, no, the, what I'm saying is these things can operate within the existing structure. I think at the end of the day, uh, everyone, from what I understand, would agree that we do not want uh, more amendments to the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. Uh, and we particularly don't want uh, politicians to be uh, hoisting uh, that without the consent of Aboriginal people who... Are you talking about Nigel Scullion, who wanted to put a series of regulations which... Well, changed... Nigel's one of many that have uh, tried and, and some have been successful, but Nigel's uh, the last and latest minister that has uh, attempted to do this. Now, regardless of what people think about individuals, at the end of the day, I believe that it's the responsibility of the federal parliament to ensure that Aboriginal people are part of that. You, you just can't go around changing things without Aboriginal people uh, being part of that conversation. It's there for their purposes. Well, let me ask, uh, Galleroy and yourself have both made um, some big statements. It seemed to be you wanted, it seemed, looking at it from the outside, that you wanted to redefine the way land rights work. Um, is that true? What is it you actually want? Many things come out of a journalist, right? Many stories. My brother and I, myself simply said that we have no intention of breaking away from the Northern Land Council. All we want is authority, a regional authority of our own piece of country here. The Northern Land Council has 
been terrific to us. It has helped us in many, many ways. It has also helped us gain our mining agreement. It's looked after many Aboriginal people and helped us protect their country for us. So, we said we do not want to break away from the Land Council, the Northern Land Council. The Northern Land Council, we want the Northern Land Council to support us. And does that mean um, support to do things like create private ownership on your own land? Absolutely. So what is that, what's the extent of that? Do you mean private ownership so people can buy their houses? And would it matter then if they sold them on to other people who weren't from your community? Not only we talk about houses, like you're saying, we want economic development on our own country. We want to have what comes up our ground. We want the wealth. We want to put a shine into our countrymen's eyes. We want to help people. We want to create jobs for our people. We want to employ our own people. But the real message is we do not want to break away from the Northern Land Council. Can I just, uh, just press you on this one point? Is it possible to change the idea of communal ownership of land and, and break it down to private ownership of land? So individuals could buy houses, something that Marcia Langton has talked about, something that other communities are doing. We want the Northern Land Council to help us in getting what we want on our own country. Joe, mm. because, you know, I'll talk to Joe, if you don't mind, because, you know, the stages that we get through in getting a lease, yeah? Mm -hmm. It, you know, it gets... Too complicated. Complicated. And that's what our countrymen in our region are looking, you know, seeing. So it's a process that, you know, normally takes about two to three months because of doing this and doing that and, you know, and, you know, they get frustrated over, over things that, you know, they see. Right. Well, you're speaking to Joe, and we, we're, because we're running out of time, I'm going to throw it straight to Joe um, to hear whether you think um, this could work, whether these two things could coexist, the idea of communal land um, as controlled by the Northern Land Council and private land organised and perhaps sold by the community here? Oh, I think it's, it's entirely doable. I, I, uh, I think we need to uh, look at the issues of uh, the fungibility of uh, title. Uh, obviously, communal property rights is fundamentally important for Aboriginal people because it recognises the unique culture and attachment that people have got. Now, I think we need to be... Uh, we use this word bold and uh, uh, visionary in respects of how does that translate into things like home ownership. Now, I don't think the things uh, are necessarily exclusive to each other, but we haven't seen any, any evidence to suggest that communal property rights, at least in our region, and we've, we've granted three 99-year home ownership leases. Uh, the last one was done about uh, six months ago, or less than six months ago, where people can then use that lease to go and get a home, a home loan. So these things can be done. Uh, and we are, and uh, my chairman and myself and the executive today gave the commitment to the family and others that we are wanting to work with traditional owners to that end so we can take that next step in land rights. We've almost 40 years into the Land Rights Act and now we need to start thinking about, well, how do we translate that into economic, social and cultural outcomes for people so they can enjoy all of the fruits available for them on their country. Can I just briefly uh, hear from Noel Pearson on this? Is, uh, Marcia Langton talks about this as if it's all a, a sort of silver bullet private ownership. Do you think it is? Uh, it's a question facing groups across the country where there's communal title to land, but families and individuals want 
to develop the land, use the land, conduct businesses, build homes and so on. Um, I think it's pretty clear in what I've seen around the countryside, but what you see internationally is if you don't give people private tenures, you won't get development. And so it's a real dilemma. You know, you don't want a Swiss cheese hole to start happening over the communal land. But at the same time, we face this kind of lesson from development, which is that unless there's private tenure of some sort, um, you can't get investment and everything else. And I think there's a way of reconciling it through long-term leases and so on. But um, I think that, that uh, in my own home community, I can stand on the boundary of um, freehold land on this side and communal land on this side, and all of the development investment is happening on, on the freehold side. It's a real challenge for us, but I think that there is an accommodation that can be reached that can keep communal land safe, but issue long-term leases to individuals. OK, let's keep moving on. Uh, with the time we've got left, we want some more questions. We've got one from Amanda Longwa. My question is um, regarding renowned educationalist, Aboriginal educationalist, Dr Chris Sara. He states that outcomes for Aboriginal students will improve when false negative stereotypes of Aboriginal people are challenged and all Australians celebrate what it is to be Aboriginal, both culture and achievements. Do you believe that this federal government is sincere when it says it wants to close the educational gap when it cuts funding to programs like the Deadly Awards, which are such a widely recognised platform upon which we can celebrate Aboriginal achievements and culture? Ken White, we'll start with you. Let me have to keep our answers short now so we can get through some more questions. Look, it's important. Education is important. Your question goes to a number of issues around budgetary decisions. It also goes to particular projects and initiatives that are, occur. And I made a comment recently that governments are often advised by their agencies. And I think one of the challenges we have is that people don't really know what happens on the ground in those organisations. I was involved with the Deadly Awards by supporting it when I was in New South Wales. And let me say the outcome of the awards night was a stunning feature of building the strength of our belief in each other because they were acknowledged for it. And change has to come in terms of education and the commitments. And I believe that we will hold our place in the future equal to that of any other person. But my point would be that I would like to see ministers for Aboriginal Affairs at every layer of government sit down with their opposition member holding the shadow portfolio, and in our case, the Greens member, and then for them to look at the priorities of how all three major parties or both parties in state and territories commit to a 10-year strategy that is unwavering, commits funding, and builds on what has been achieved to close the gap because it would then eliminate governments having to come in and make changes based on the individual thoughts of a particular minister. I have seen that time in, time out over the years, and I think a truly multi-partisan approach over a decade to the education of Aboriginal young people would make an incredible difference. It would also apply to all programs. Now, Ken, um, in the meantime, uh, should someone find the money for the Deadly Awards, which were hugely <coughs> uh, successful as a demonstration of Aboriginal excellence? I've had a discussion with the Parliamentary Secretary and suggested that we should seriously look at reviving the Deadly Awards itself. But I know a, uh, an evaluation was undertaken by KPMG and that money was provided by the Commonwealth for a transition period, uh, which would have enabled those deadly awards to occur. Uh, I think the facet that was, or the part of it that was uh, being debated was the magazine. But look, there is still uh, thoughts around the importance of the deadlies. The commitment is there, okay. and I've not seen the evaluation report. 
I, I, nobody just wants to respond to this. Yeah, I, I think um, government made a really, really, really bad decision in cutting the, um, the, well, what was in effect of the entire budget of the vibe. But it wasn't Gavin Jones, who unfortunately is no longer with us, um, he dedicated his life to inspiring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and across this entire country. A report was undertaken in November and December where KPMG gave an absolute glowing report of his entire program. Gavin's program, um, he, he succeeded in obtaining funding for 19 years. This should have been the 20th year of the deadlies. Gavin's magazines reached out to 55,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids across this country. He was a Logie finalist this year for one of his television programs. His um, radio programs that reached out right across this country. The three on threes, you know, they, they were mentoring programs. They were, you know, the, the entire um, major event on a calendar year for Aboriginal kids, which I know they, they came here to Yirrkala many times. This was a program that should never, ever have been cut. And what we've seen now, where a government wants to go out and say, we want to close the gap on health and education on, and reduce incarceration, every, all of those things is what Gavin's program encompassed. And it did all of that. And I won't have anyone tell me any different. That program should never have been cut. It was advised badly, but again, if someone had have actually read the report that says the, that that program should never have been cut. I I'm sorry was, to... Sorry, uh, just uh, Annette, there, there, yeah. was a, there was ongoing funding and there were discussions that did occur. So it's not totally true to say it was cut in the sense that you've described. Well, the, but, but let me also say there are other commitments to a range of programs for education at the community level across this nation. And there are challenges for all governments in the way that they fund education programs, tackle incarceration rates, improve health outcomes, improve economic participation, and you have to make judgments sometimes as to what the reach is. And I don't and disagree with you. And this reach was you. six out of ten. No, 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 but six I don't out of ten Aboriginal you. kids right across this country. No, no, but we're also talking about those at the front line that have a direct a impact them on them. Where... Okay, I'm, so, I'm sorry I'm going to have to wind no, that one up because we've got, we've got time. I'm sorry to those with their hands up on this issue too. We have time for only one last question, I'm sorry to say. It comes from Gina Smith. <coughs> as, a Warram <coughs> as a Warramunga woman, I live in three worlds. In the European world, I live... So I have a house, a job and two children. In my Umbrani world, I am responsible for passing on my culture to my extended family and the community. <clears throat> and in my third world, I, am ob I have to meet the obligations of both, both worlds. So as leaders, how do you balance your worlds without compromising your culture and your values? I start with John Gove here. John Gove. I'm no leader, but... <laughs> People are laughing at that. I think, you, I think you probably are, whether you know it or not. If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She is right. Um, as Indigenous young people, we are not... We, are, we don't <laughs> complain, oh, sorry, claim ourselves as leaders because um, we are chosen... <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. So how do you walk in these different worlds? Well, as an individual, I know I have families everywhere. And therefore, in this area, in the Northeast Arnhem, we're all related from here down to as far as Millionby. There are ways that we can find for ourselves how to be able to do things. You go up to this side of the world where the Western society 
and then there's our side. We, as Yolngo, can stabilize ourselves with what we have and then go out to face the world with what we have. It doesn't matter if what, what we have within us is the thing that we can all achieve out there. Joe, do you see it the same way? I see it the same way. When, when, uh, when we look for the next leadership, we don't normally point one. We tend to not judge the person first. We tell the person, not tell them, but we can always advise them. Advise them. To be the next leader in your own, for the next own group, we look in a person that is very, very smart. He's of cultural knowledge who can carry out ceremonial duties. And that's when the leaders say, we want him next, to be the next leader in our own community. And you also look for people who can work out how to live in the other world. Yes. The white world. The so. white world. Yeah. Nova, how about you? Um, yeah, I, one of the things I find is that you never you lose and never forget the substance of, of who you are as a person. Um, all the things that I've done in my lifetime in sports and now in politics is nothing compared to what my grandmother endured and her ability to wake up every day and find a reason to live for. And what she endured in those 12 years of those mission days were just horrific. And I can't even imagine what it must have been like. So I think that walking in the world as an Aboriginal person in a white man's world is relatively easy because at times when the going gets tough, I think you've got nothing on what your grandmother went through. And it's being able to draw upon that strength as who you are as an Aboriginal person. And there's not a reason that I wake up every day and think I can't go on. Because if I do that, then I'm failing the people who have fought before me. And, um, you know, as, as women, um, we're, we're the, the, the creators of our, of our children. You know, like the fathers. We, we're all mentors and we're all role models for our children. So I think first and foremost, it's identifying who you are and the reason, you know, why we have to go forward. Ken, there's a conflict between the two worlds? No, there's not, because I stay grounded in my family and in my community. I listened over years to leaders around me. I've listened to elders across this nation. I have learned the lessons from them and learned how to walk wisely, to listen with respect and to work closely with people and to honour your commitment to the people who put you in a leadership role. When I was elected, elders, Nyungar elders came and put on my shoulders a booker with two red feathers. They said to me, you are one of our Britiers. You have a role as a leader. Lead for the people of Hasluck, but also don't forget to continue to remain grounded in Nyungar community and in the Aboriginal society. Joe. I don't think they're necessarily uh, uh, conflictual, but there's always potential for conflict between uh, being seen to be a leader in the non-Aboriginal world and then um, being a leader in your Aboriginal community. Uh, by the way, Gina, I think that you're a leader uh, in given what I know and understand what you've done in, in Tennant Creek, Tennant Creek being a very uh, polarising town. And, uh, but I do think it's, it's also part of understanding the nature of the trade-offs because if you're good at one thing, then you have to give up something in, in somewhere else. And if you're able to uh, realise that and understand the nature of the balance that you need to uh, put out there, then I think Obviously, you can walk between those two worlds in a lot more of a comfortable fashion, but understanding that 
just because you're perceived to be a, a leader in non-Aboriginal society is not necessarily the same as being a leader in your uh, Aboriginal society. And finally, Noel, um, you've put a lot of thought into this. Um, you get the final word here, but it yeah. has to be reasonably quick. Yeah. Um, our vision for young people in Cape York is to be bicultural. We borrowed that from Dr Unipingu's concept. We were inspired by the idea of biculturalism. Um, I don't think we quite realise how absolutely privileged Aboriginal kids are to have two cultures available to them. They can live and achieve in the best of both. And in Cape York, our vision is that, that we should have a strong home base, but we should go out into the world in orbits and come back home. We say Cape York to New York. <laughs> we want our children to have a strong home base, but also have the facility to go out into the world in pursuit of art, sport, education, careers, but always be anchored back home. And I, I think that privilege of biculturalism, my dream is that one day the non-Aboriginal kids of Australia will share that biculturalism. They will also have the privilege of learning something about and connecting with the original languages and cultures of this country. And we we'll all share in that great privilege. Thank you very much. And uh, hold your applause because you'll get a chance to do that again in a minute because sadly we're out of time. So much more that we need to discuss. Please thank our panel. Joe Morrison, uh, Noel Pearson, <laughs> Dungal Gruwiwi, Jawa Unifingu, Nova Paris and Ken White. Thank you and a very special thanks to our your new host, the Yachty Indy Foundation, the Gama Festival and this amazing audience. Give yourselves a quick round of applause. Thank you very much. Now, next Monday, Q&A will be joined by the former Labor Cabinet Minister, Greg Combay, the Assistant Education Minister, Susan Lay, Canadian Professor of Theology and Culture, John Stackhouse, WikiLeaks and Human Rights Lawyer, Jen Robinson, and the editor of the IPA's Freedom Watch, Simon Breeny. And we'll finish tonight with Emma Donovan, Jonathan Peace, Patu Pal and Declan Kelly performing their version of Midnight Oil's Dead Heart until next Monday's Q&A. Good night. Nyala gala ge irugunga yara purgundiya yara gara ge ilugunga yara purgundiya custom don't speak your tongue white men came to every word yeah. we don't serve your country don't serve your king no your custom don't speak your tongue white men came to every word be stolen following the steps of our ancestry that cannot be broken hey be broken we don't serve your country don't serve your king white men listen to the songs we sing white men came took everything
of our ancestry that cannot be broken. Every in our hearts, the true country that cannot be stolen. We follow in the steps of our ancestry that cannot be Yarang Urgul Bia Yarang Urgul Bia